Hello and welcome to Lecture 4 from Session 13 of the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program. I'm Adam Miller, and today we're going to be talking about non-parametric measures of periodicity, or as I like to call it, return of the gaps. Okay, let's jump in. We are going to look at some non-parametric methods. So loam scargle, we were actually fitting a model to the data, which is why I call that a parametric method. Uh, that model being some uh, Fourier series that's fit to the data and then uh, optimized over a grid of frequencies. But now we're going to use non-parametric methods to look for periodic signals. Um, while loam scargle is considered the standard in astronomy, in part because it was the first good method developed for noisy and sparse data, it does have a few warts. In particular, Lone Scargle does not handle outliers well, so if you've got some random point that's way far away from all of the other observations, that's going to really tweak the chi-squared measurements that you make at every frequency. And also, Lone Scargle works best on purely sinusoidal signals. So if you have some signal, let's say a transiting planet, Right? that doesn't look like a sinusoid at all, then Lone Scargle may not do a great job at pulling out the periodicity that's present in the data. So today we're going to look at some alternatives. We'll start by simulating a signal. We're going to use multiple harmonics to make things a little bit more challenging than just trying to recover a pure sinusoid. And if you execute the cell below, you'll generate a periodic signal with a period of 0.7 days, sampled over two months, with an average of two observations per night. Okay, so let's quickly look at this code. Um, you can see here that we have observations that are taken at random times over a range of 60 days. Uh, we have some phase that will come into play in a second of pi and some variance on the noise. And then we use the gen periodic data function. This is the same function that we used in lecture three and notebook three. It is located at the very bottom of this notebook if you want to see how this works. But in short, we put in the time of observation, the period that we want to use, the amplitude of the signal, the phase of the signal, and then the variance. And then I've added a couple harmonics here. So we also have um, additional signal at half the period of the, the dominant or true period of the signal, as well as some signal at uh, one third of the true period. We add all of those signals up, okay, and then we can plot the phase folded light curve using, again, our helper function from lecture three, phase plot with the time of observations, the signal, the best fit period, or we know the correct period in this case, as well as the uncertainties on the, on the observations. And so here we have some signal, and you can see that this looks very clearly periodic, but again, this is not a pure sinusoid. Um, we have some structure here. This almost even looks like a little bit like a contact binary. Okay, great. So now let's run Loam Scargle on this simulated data and see what we find. All right, so we want to import Loam Scargle from AstroPy. We then want to measure the frequencies and the uh, power spectral density for these observations. We're going to use a maximum frequency of 5 in this case. We know that the period is longer than 0.2 days, so we don't need to go higher than a frequency of 5. We find that the best fit period, as measured by the Lone Scargle periodogram, is 0.35 days, and the answer was 0.7. So what we've actually found is half the period. And so this looks sort of periodic here, but you can see that there's a great deal of scatter at every phase, and that's because we don't quite have the correct period. Okay, so um, this is a very common problem for eclipsing binaries. If you run Loam Scargle on a whole bunch of variable sources that have been found, many of the eclipsing binaries, or EBs, are going to be recovered at half of the actual true period. Okay, so um, let's consider some alternatives then to Loam Scargle. And we're going to demonstrate, actually, that each of these uh, initial alternatives that we consider can be implemented in Python without a lot of uh, coding that's needed. All right, so method one that we're going to consider is called the string length method. The string length, the, excuse me, the string length method 
phase folds the data at trial periods, that should sound familiar relative to loam scargle, and then it minimizes the distance to connect the phase ordered observations. So let's look at a figure that demonstrates what this looks like, right? So here's a simple sinusoid. In the bottom plot here, things have been folded at the correct period, and you can see that the length of string that you need to connect all the observations in phase order is relatively small compared to the data when it's been folded at the incorrect period and you need a lot of string in order to connect all the phase ordered points in this instance. So if you can measure this string length, you can then do that at many, many frequencies and the frequency that gives you the minimum period is your optimal period. Okay. So let's write a function called calc string length that calculates the string length for a phase folded light curve with observations x, y, and frequency f. Now, a note to those of you that are watching this lecture at home, I'm going to continue by looking directly at the solutions. In the notebook that you have at home, portions of the solutions have been removed, and I encourage you to pause this lecture and try to work out the solution on your own before continuing the video. Okay. With that said, we're going to move on now to the solutions. So we want a function called calculate string length. We're going to input x, y, and frequency. In this case, we're making the frequency uh, an optional argument, but that doesn't super matter. And we just want to calculate and return the string length, which is, which, which is just going to be a float. Right, so in this case, with the uh, uh, times and the frequency, we can calculate the phases. And then it turns out that the string length is fairly simple to calculate. We just want to take the sum of the uh, <clears throat> distance between the points. And so if you have two points, you can measure their distance uh, in a 2D space with the uh, NumPy hypotenuse function. All right, and then we're just going to, on the x-axis, have the phases, although we want to put those in order. So we have NumPy sort phases. And then we also want to have the uh, y values. And in this case, we have um, the y values that have been sorted, again, based on their relative phase. Now, the one thing that I've added here, the little trick that simplifies this to one line of code and removes any for loop, is that I've calculated the difference between the relative phases and the relative y values, and we're just measuring the hypotenuse along those. Um, this returns then an array of the distance between each of the individual points. That's what this np diff does here. And then when we take the sum of that, we get the string length. Okay. So now, we want to write a function called string length periodogram or SL periodogram to measure the string length for our input data x, y over a frequency grid f grid. So this is going to look very similar to what we did during lecture three, but we have the SL periodogram. As input, we have x, y, and some frequency grid f grid. And all we have to do in this case is loop over every frequency within f grid in order to return SLPSD, okay, the power spectral density. It's not actually a power spectral density, but a measure of the uh, good models at every frequency from the string length method. So in this case, we have um, SLPSD is just an empty array of the same shape as F grid. And then we want to loop over every frequency in F grid and calculate the string length at those frequencies. Okay. Finally, let's plot the string length periodogram for the simulated data. And as we look at this, let's ask ourselves, does this make sense? Okay. As a hint, remember that there are optimal grid choices that can be made depending on your data. They do vary slightly depending on the algorithm you're using, but the rules of thumb that we developed during lecture three apply well here as well. So we have some grid that goes from a maximum frequency that is 1 over the uh, duration, capital T is the variable we used previously for that, of the data, all the way up to a frequency of 10. And then we want to be able to resolve the individual peaks in this periodogram. And so that's why uh, we use a spacing of um, 1 over 5T, capital T. All right. 
so then we calculate the periodogram and everything else here is just plotting and I've conveniently added some inset uh, axes here in order to show the a zoom in around very low uh, sorry very high frequencies or the region around uh, the correct period here so here we see that the string length is much much shorter and especially in the inset we can see this at a correct period of 0 0.7 days and there are harmonics that also give good string length values those are all multiples of the 0 0.7 day period so 2x 3x 4x etc as you can see here in the full plot and so string length at least for this particular example seems to work pretty well okay so that's great the main downside to the string length method is that it doesn't account for observational uncertainties. So we may have some points that look like outliers and as a result they could blow up or reduce the string length measurement depending on the phase that you select. But if those are outliers that have appropriately measured uncertainties, i.e. they're not statistically major outliers, they're just outliers in terms of um, the pure signal that's been measured itself, you won't really capture this with the string length method. So that downside of lone scargle also applies to the string length method. Um, that being said, we were able to calculate string lengths very, very quickly. Uh, so that is a benefit of using the string length method. Okay. The second method that we're going to consider today is the phase dispersion minimization method, or PDM. And again, like lone scargle, we're going to fold the data at a large number of trial frequencies f. All right. So after we have these trial frequencies, we uh, phase up the data to create a phase plot, and then we divide that phase plot into different bins. So here's an example with 10 bins. In every single bin, we're going to calculate the variance, and then we're going to combine those estimates via a sum or average and we're going to compare that to the overall variance that's present in the signal. So essentially, if you get things correctly phase ordered, as we can see in the bottom plot here, the variance in the individual bins is going to be relatively low because the observations over a one-tenth in phase for a periodic source are not going to vary that much relative to the overall amplitude and variations that you see. Alternatively, if you have some uh, very poorly selected frequency on which you phase fold the data, you don't get any sort of order to your observations within the indi individual bins, as can be seen on the top figure here. And as a result, there is a scatter that is more or less the same as when the data are not folded. Okay. This method, because we're just looking at the dispersion in these individual bins, does not make any sort of functional form does not assume any functional form for the signal. So this uh, can be a good way to find signals in non-sinusoidal data, right? This can be an advantage relative to lone scargle. Okay, so now for problem 2a, I'm going to ask you to write a function called calculate the phase dispersion minimization or calc PDM write a function that calculates the average dispersion and scatter in n equally spaced bins for a phase folded light curve where you have observations x, y, and some frequency f. And then we want to specify the number of bins via a keyword argument called bins. And again, I'll remind you that in your version of the lecture, the solutions have been slightly removed. I encourage you to pause right now and spend a moment trying to solve this on your own. Okay, moving on. So here we have uh, a function. It looks very similar to what we wrote in the string length problem, okay, except here we're calculating the PDM. We've added this optional argument, bins is equal to 10, but otherwise we're inputting data x and y with some frequency f. Okay. For the function itself, we need to calculate the phases. We then are going to loop over the bins. So we have one bin for, uh, oh, and there's actually a typo right here. So this should actually be, we're just going to correct this on the fly. Uh, this should be range bins. Okay. The problem, 
<clears throat> and that should be bins, and that should be bins, okay. Um, so we basically want to loop over every bin, and we're saying that the data within any individual bin is where the phase is equal to the bin number divided by the number of bins. The phase is greater than the bin number divided by the number of bins and less than the value of the next bin divider. Um, then, if there's more than one point uh, in a given bin, we want to measure the scatter or standard deviation of the data within that bin. So standard deviation of y of this bin, and then divide that by the number of bins. And we add that up for every bin that has data within it. Uh, and that's how we get our phase dispersion minimization. Okay. So now I want you to write a function called PDM periodogram to measure the relative reduction in the scatter for a phase folded light curve with input data x, y over a frequency grid, f grid, and then plot the periodogram of that. So we're going to use the function that we just created, and then we're going to look at how the scatter changes while using these phase folded bins relative to the overall scatter in the model. Again, this is going to look pretty similar to what we had before. We've got some data, x and y, as well as an f grid. <clears throat> and we have some output power spectral density, or periodogram, whatever you want to call it, that is going to be the same shape as f grid. We want to calculate the total RMS, or scatter, in the light curve, which is just the standard deviation of y. And then for every frequency within our grid, we're going to calculate the phase dispersion minimization. We're going to divide that by the total RMS. So if we've significantly reduced the scatter by folding things on the correct or close to correct period, then we're going to end up with some number that's very low. So in this case, we're looking for minima as opposed to maxima, like we did for lone scargle. Okay, so after we loop over all those frequencies, we just want to return the results. Right, and here we have a plot of this being run on the sample data that we generated at the very beginning. So again, we want to create our grid looking just as it would for the Loam Scargo periodogram. We are also then going to calculate the uh, PDM periodogram. And this is plotting code that is identical to what we had in the previous problem when we were plotting the phase dispersion, uh, excuse me, the periodogram for string length. Okay. So here, once again, we can see that there's many spikes at low periods. And then when we zoom in on the region around uh, a few days, we see that the most significant reduction in scatter, or the dispersion minimization, is best at a period of 0 0.7 days, the correct period. We also see power at the half period, as well as uh, harmonics, like twice the period, three times the period, etc. So this method seems to find the correct period for the trial data, so that's great. Um, like the string length method, the PDM does not incorporate observational uncertainties, though you could make a slight modification and measure the chi-squared in every bin as a way to incorporate uncertainties into your overall measurement. Okay, but the main challenge for those that would like to maybe use PDM as a way to find periodic signals in their data, is deciding on the number of bins to adopt. In this case, we set a default equal to 10, and I think 10 is a pretty common choice when people are working on problems like this. But depending on how much data you have, and if you have many, many, many observations, um, a choice of 10 bins or 100 bins could actually lead to a different measurement of the best period. And the fact that there's no way to sort of optimize the number of bins for all types of variability is the main challenge for this method. Nevertheless, if you're looking for something like an eclipsing binary, as we just saw, PDM might do a better job of recovering the correct period than what you would otherwise find from Loam Scargle. This method is also pretty quick if you implemented it and executed the previous cells. Here's another method that's very popular in the literature. It's called the analysis of variance, and ultimately it's very similar to PDM. Basically, optimal periods are defined via hypothesis testing. 
and there are certain types of astronomical signals for which analysis of variance works quite well. Uh, but like all of these methods, there is no sort of uh, catch-all. You can't use AOV and get every single type of variable pulsating, uh, eclipsing, rotating, and get their periods uh, absolutely correct. Okay. Method four is one that I want to dive into in a little bit more detail, in part because this is a non-parametric method that uses uh, smooth representations of the data. And I note this again later in the notebook, but one thing that's nice about SuperSmoother is that this method actually has nothing to do with periodicity. Uh, it's just a way to produce a smooth representation of some data that is changing as a function of time or function of position. Okay, so let's dive into the details for how this works. So SuperSmoother is a least squares approach, wherein a flexible, non-parametric model is fit to the folded observations at many trial frequencies. Okay, so we're going to smooth the data at every frequency in some frequency grid f. We're then going to look at how that smooth model compares to the actual observations, and we'll compare the quality of that model at some given folded frequency f to the uh, overall scatter in the data and like lone scargle find the model that basically reduces the scatter the most and consider that to be our best frequency um, by using a very flexible model this helps to reduce aliasing issues that are relative to models that assume a sinusoidal shape so in other words super smoother by not making any sort of assumptions about what the shape of the periodic signal is doesn't avoid some of the problems where it's common to fit the half period or twice the period with loam scargle that occurs. Um, the cost for super smoother, at least for this particular algorithm, is that it is pretty slow and we'll demonstrate that here. Okay, so um, the way that the smooth representation is developed for super smoother is via a localized linear regression. In other words, basically, you know, you have your phase folded data, let's take some small window, we'll fit a linear function in that small window, and we'll use that to estimate the value of what the smooth function should be over that small range or at some specific point. Um, observations from this smooth representation are compared to, sorry, the actual observations are compared to the smooth model that's made by this uh, localized linear regression to identify the model, the smooth model, that optimally reduces the sum of the squares of the residuals, okay, or what we have called chi-squared in the last couple of lectures. And when uncertainties are available, you can normalize the uh, square of the residuals by the uncertainties. Okay. A couple things, there are some knobs that need to be turned or optimized before running the algorithm. SuperSmoother requires a user-selected smoothing window. This is called the span. It's what I'll call the span for the rest of these slides, which is just a sliding region over which the linear fit is performed. So just very quickly, you could imagine, right, if you're going to look at 5% uh, of phase space, 5% of phase space, 5% of phase space, phase space, phase space, you're going to end up with um, models that sort of more closely match every little sort of tick up, tick down that are present in the data. If you use a wider span, let's say 25%, then you're going to get something that's a little bit less prone to following the noise, but it will also sort of undercount the peaks and the valleys that may be present in your data because it's going to be averaging over a, a much uh, larger window. Okay, So the sort of magic in super smoother is that there isn't sort of a single identified span that is then adopted and used but instead uh, cross validation is used to figure out what is the optimal span at every phase within the data set and then that optimal span is adopted in order to create something that's uh, a bit more smooth and kind of takes on the best features of both a, a very narrow span and a very wide span so the pseudocode for this is to uh, initially create three smooth local linear estimations of the data or signal Y, 
at every input position x. And the sort of default spans are 0 0.05, 0 0.2, and 0 0.5. Okay. Then at every position, you want to optimize, uh, you want to identify the optimal span, and you do that by looking at the residuals. So you compare what the value of the uh, smooth model is to the actual observation, and the optimal model is the one that is closest to the actual observations. You then smooth uh, this optimal span at every position with another smooth curve and a span of equal, equal to 0 0.2. So we're going to take out the strong kinks by performing another smooth. And then finally, the final model is created by interpolating between the smooth models to the optimal span that was generated in part three of the pseudocode. All right, this is a lot of words, a lot of words, and I recognize that this is probably a lot to take in. So to demonstrate this, we're gonna build each portion of this code step by step, and we'll look at some plots to see how this works. And then from there, we are going to uh, put it all together in a single package and then build a periodogram as we've done for all of the other methods considered today. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. All right. So for the next problem, I want you to write a function smooth that estimates the value of y at every phase phase via a linear least squares fit to all of the observations within plus or minus span divided by 2. Now, when you perform this fit, the observed value of y at phase phase should be excluded from the fit. This is the, essentially the cross-validation. The short reason for why you want to exclude the value of y is that you're trying to predict the value of y. So if you have you know, a point that's right here and then you're fitting a line to a bunch of other points around that, um, that point is going to play heavily by being right in the center of the line in terms of what the model uh, predicts there. If you remove that observation, you get a better estimate of what the, uh, I shouldn't say, you get a less biased estimate. That is the correct thing to say a less biased estimate of what the model should be at that particular phase. I think it's going to be helpful if we write this function to have inputs of x and f as opposed to inputs of phase. This will matter when we want to build our periodogram later. And I also want to note, I said this before, but you can super smooth any series of data. Okay, So it doesn't have to be frequency. You just need to normalize your times or your spatial inputs to be between 0 and 1, and then you could run super smoother on it. Okay, uh, this function actually ends up being a little bit big, so we'll go through the code here, and uh, I don't actually ask you to work this out on your own at home. So we have some <clears throat> new function called smooth, input signal y, observations taken at positions or times x. We need a frequency on which to fold, or you can uh, pass this as an optional argument with none in case you're just smoothing data that is not um, periodic, some default span, 0 0.05 in this case, and whether or not there are uncertainties. All right, so let's look at the code. So if um, uncertainties are passed in as just an integer, we create an array from that integer. Uh, if the frequency is not passed in, it's assumed that you just want to smooth some series of data. The phases are then calculated from the minimum to the maximum from 0 to 1, otherwise phase is calculated in the correct way, in the, in the typical way, I should say. All right, and so here we get into the actual code. So we have smooth is equal to some empty array like x. We then want to iterate over every phase within our phases. And we want to say, um, OK, this fit, uh, everywhere that the phase is within span over 2 and the phase is not equal to the phase itself, okay? We want to keep those points for part of our local linear estimation. All right, I've also noted here that there is a little bit of a kludge, uh, which is that we require that there is at least one observation before the phase in question and one observation after the phase in question for numerical stability. 
Uh, if you have questions about that, I encourage you to ask during the q and I'm not going to cover that in great detail right now. All right, so after we select the data points that should be included in the local linear fit, we then perform a, a, a linear fit uh, where we incorporate the uncertainties if they're available, otherwise we ignore them. So that's all that this if and else statement is doing. And then after that, we estimate the smooth value to just be the value of the linear fit at that phase. Okay. Then if we have missing values, which might happen if say you've got a uh, narrow span and there are no data points that are present when you're folded at the particular period in question, right? then we just return a value of infinity and we just interpolate over those values at the end of the day. So um, we just have missing smooth here and this interpolation function will take any observations, sorry, not observations, any uh, smooth values that aren't present and we'll just interpolate over those particular values. And then we return the non-parametric estimate for the signal. Okay, so let's see what this actually looks like. So we've created this. We now want to create a smooth representation of the data with three different spans, 0 0.05, 0 0.2, and 0 0.5. Okay, here we go. Calculate the phases here. We'll need that for plotting purposes. We then make our three different smooth estimates, which you can see here. After doing our normal phase plot of the data, we then show what the smooth models look like. Okay. And this more or less follows exactly what I said. So the tiny span does a good job of capturing what's happening at the uh, minima and the peaks, but it also has a tendency to follow the noise a bit more, right? We can see that it's a lot more jagged, the estimates that come from this tiny span. And in fact, there's a weird, right, uh, downslope right here. That doesn't seem like that's probably a correct representation of the smooth signal. Alternatively, the very large span, 0 0.5, right? This ends up with a relatively smooth model, but one that consistently does a poor job, fairly consistently does a poor job of actually estimating what's going on with the data. Okay. And then we have in between those two what looks like a moderately uh, good representation that nevertheless uh, underestimates the maximum here and the minimum here. Okay. All right. So that's the first part of our pseudocode. But <clears throat> what we need to do now is identify the optimal span at every phase. And the way we do that is by estimating the residual at every phase and picking whichever span has the smallest residual. Okay. To do this, we've taken, uh, we're creating what I'm calling the smooth list, and we're just stacking each of our smooth representations. Okay. And then we're measuring the residuals by subtracting each of these smooth representations from the data itself, why? That's what this resid thing is here. And then by looking for the minimum of this subtraction along the first axis. So essentially at every point, we're just saying which residual is the smallest, 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. And then um, we find those minima along axis zero, and that tells us what the best span is at every position. And this span list is just an array that has 0 0.05 in the first column, 0 0.2 everywhere in the second column, and 0 0.5 everywhere in the third column. All right. So this is just allowing us to pull out the best span with a few lines of code here. All right. So now, pseudocode step three is that we need to smooth the best span array using our intermediate span, or 0 0.2 in this case. So we want to create a smooth representation of the best smooth. Now, if you're at home and you do best span, you'll see that we have some array that has like 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.05. 0 .05, 0 .05. It's jumping around a lot. And we want to smooth that down to create a more smooth representation of the data. So we're just going to smooth 
our best span array using a span of 0 0.2, and we plot that result here. So instead of having something that's jumping over very, very large values, we get a representation that is a bit more smooth, although there are still jagged changes here. Nevertheless, more smooth than the representation uh, that we had from best span. Okay, so now that we have this optimal span at every position x, we want to count, or at every phase, I should say, we want to calculate the super smooth representation of the data. And the way that we do that is by interpolating from the three initial smooth estimates to the span mid range estimate. So, to, to show you what that means, at this value here, this is something like the fifth data point within our phase folded data. The optimal smooth value is 0 0.23. What we're going to do now is interpolate between the 0 0.2 smooth and the span equals 0 0.5 smooth. And we're going to interpolate to what their estimates are for y at a value of 0 0.23 ish. Okay. So that's the next step. And so all we need here then is an interpolation function. So we're going to say that the super smooth is, again, some empty array that looks like smooth midrange. We're then going to loop over span midrange and populate every entry within super smooth by interpolating from the span uh, midrange array from the value of the optimal span. That's what we called span mid-range here. Okay. We're going to interpolate uh, from the smooth list that we had created previously a couple steps ago. Okay. So now that we've created that super smooth representation of the data, let's overplot that on the data. So here we have all the same code we had before, but we're also adding in a plot of the super smooth representation. And so here we can see that we have something that isn't quite as jagged as the span equals 0 0.5, uh, and otherwise is a fairly smooth model for what's happening in the data. Uh, is this perfect? Is it absolutely eye-pleasing to look at? Uh, no. <laughs> right? There are still some uh, jagged behavior here. Right? It's not a totally smooth model. But this is also a model that assumes no functional form for the data whatsoever, right? And we do, nevertheless, have an estimation for what the income input signal is at every phase uh, p. So that's what we've gotten here out of SuperSmoother. Okay. So now I want to ask you to basically put all of that together into a single function, calculate SuperSmooth. So we have familiar inputs in this case, uh, y and x, some frequency f. All right. Um, over which you will fold the data. We then have a list of spans. Okay. We're we're going to do this as a list, and we're going to loop over this, creating a smooth at 0 0.05, 0 0.2, and 0 0.5. And then we have uncertainties if they're available. Otherwise, things are going to look very similar to code that we've already developed as part of this particular problem. So we correct the uncertainties to be an array if they're only an integer. We calculate the phases. If there's no frequency given, the phase is just normalized all observations from 0 to 1. Otherwise, we calculate the phases themselves. We use a little bit of list comprehension in order to make what we had previously called our smooth list. So by list comprehension, I mean we have here uh, smooth of y and the, uh, oh, that's t obs, that's a typo. That should be x. Again, we're fixing things on the fly. This is why you don't want to work with live coding, OK? All right, so that should be smooth of y and x at frequency f. Uh, span, OK, so this is the list comprehension. Span is equal to s for s in spans. So we had spans as a list here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create a smooth for every value in spans. And then each one of those is going to become part of a list here that then is going to get all stacked together. 
So this is just like a nice little Python trick that prevents us from having to write a for loop or having to limit the number of spans that we include. So if you wanted to, you could throw in 10 different spans and then get the best super smoother from that. It would slow down your calculation a lot though. One thing to keep in mind. Okay. We then uh, create the span list just as we did before. We calculate the residuals. We develop the, we then do the smooth representation of the best span at every position X as we did before, which is called span mid-range. And then we interpolate the actual smooth models to the optimal or span mid-range values, which is what's done here at the end. And we return all of that as an array called super smooth. So this, again, this is just putting together the pieces that we had before, uh, although in a slightly more compact fashion. Makes, that makes things a little bit more general. All right, so now we want to write a function as we have for every other thing that we've looked at today called super smooth periodogram to calculate the super smoother periodogram. And unlike the other methods above, our representation of the model will allow us to calculate a chi-squared at every frequency. So like we did for loam scargle, we want to use chi-squared naught, or what is the chi-squared for a constant flat model as a relative baseline when calculating the power at every frequency that we search. Okay, so here's our function. It looks just like all of our other periodogram functions. Uh, so we're getting a chi-squared naught value. We're creating a PSD at every um, frequency. And then we just want to loop over the frequencies, calculate the super smooth model, and then calculate the value of the power spectrum at that given frequency. Okay, I went a little quick there, but that's because we've done um, several of these at this point. Okay, so now, Let's calculate and plot the super smoother periodogram for the simulated data. And I just want to note, I've said this already, but super smoother is a lot slower than any other method that we've tried to, to, to write up thus far. And so we're only going to limit our search here to a frequency grid that goes from 0 0.6 to 3. Okay, so we're talking about a period of roughly like 0 0.3 days, uh, 0.33 days, up to about a period of 2. Okay, and we're only going to search a thousand points over that range. All right, so let's execute that. In this case, we don't have to wait because I have the results already, but this will take a little bit of time, several seconds, maybe up to a minute or two, depending on the machine you're using. Okay, but when we look at the periodogram in this, in this case, we see that, aha, super smoother manages to identify the correct period. Okay, that's great. There's also power at the half period, and then harmonics of the half period and harmonics of the true period. Okay. But the correct period does have the highest peak here. That's great. Um, that's wonderful news. Okay. The true downside of super smoother, if you actually go back and execute all of those cells, is pretty obvious. And that's that super smoother is S L O W slow. It is so slow. Uh, in this case, we ran a frequency grid that only had a thousand points in it, but it was still substantially slower than our previous examples. And each of the previous examples had grids that had upwards of 10,000 points in them. Okay. So super smoother is not a fast way to search for periodicity in the data. Nevertheless, it does, by not assuming any particular shape, do a good job of recovering eclipsing binaries, for example, where uh, loam scargle may otherwise not do so well. Okay. Um, fortunately for all of us, and it seems like this is the case for almost everything that we encounter in the DSFP, Jake Vanderplas has created a faster implementation of Super Smoother. It's available via AstroPy or AstroML, one of those two libraries, but you can get Super Smoother and implement it a bit faster than the function that we just created today. Okay, so we have just now covered four, one, two, three, four alternatives to the loam scargle periodogram for measuring periodicity. And I'll give you a little bit of a news flash. Uh, notebook four, which you'll be working on after this lecture, involves yet another, so that's five, five, count them alternatives to loam scargle for measuring periodicity. 
And if I'm being honest, at this point, you should be a little bit sick of creating frequency grids. You should be a little bit sick of looking at periodograms. But you should also be very, very uh, disturbed. Disturbed is not quite the right word, but very disappointed in the fact that all of these methods produce some best fit period, but none of them provide an uncertainty on that period, right? And that's uh, somewhat problematic because uncertainties are at the heart of all analysis, of all inference that we want to do. Suppose, for instance, that I cared a lot about measuring the age of a whole bunch of stars, which, granted, that's an incredibly important problem for understanding things like the evolution of the Milky Way. One way to do this is by looking at the rotation period of those stars. And this is a field called uh, gyrochronology, but the basic idea is that with time, stars rotate uh, ever and ever more slowly. Now, if I use Lohmskargel and I say, this star has a rotation period of three, and then you say, great, what's the uncertainty on that so that I can add it to my plot and fit a model for age as a function of rotation period? Because I use Lohmskargel, I would say the uncertainty on that measurement is non-existent. And that's a problem. That's a real problem for then trying to build inference based on the period measurements that you get from all of these methods where you just have some frequency grid. Now, ideally, optimization of models often deals with things uh, like looking at the gradient of the uh, probability density for the model parameters. But Periodic models are highly nonlinear, and you can actually see that when you look at the periodogram, right? We get these very strong and narrow peaks exactly at the correct period. But if you're off by just a little bit, so for our ex example data, uh, suppose you try a period of 0 0.68, pretty close but not quite the correct period. And then you want to have some optimization that says, okay, um, figure out the optimal direction to go from my starting point of six, 0 0.68. If you're just fitting a line to some data, okay, and you need a slope like this, and you started a slope like this, well, if you increase the slope a little bit, that model's better. If you increase it a little bit more, that model's better. If you increase it a little bit more, that model's better. And so you can essentially search for the optimal slope by just changing the slope slightly and figuring out which direction that change improves things the most. Okay? And that's what I mean by a linear model. But that doesn't work for periodic models. If your period uh, or, or frequency is wrong and you move by just a little bit, you may actually end up with a representation of the data that's even worse. So there's no guarantee under some standard optimization procedure that if you start close to the correct answer at 0 0.68, that you'll then be able to take a step to 0 0.69 and then a step to 0 0.7 and say, waha, I found it. And ultimately, this is why we basically have these trial and error methods. This is why you work on a frequency grid to identify the optimal period. But that should be dissatisfying for reasons that I just went over regarding the lack of uncertainty on our measurements. So there's been some effort uh, in building Bayesian methods as opposed to sort of all of these trial frequencies to um, come up with period fitting methods uh, that allow estimates of uncertainties. Okay? Historically, uh, Brett Horst developed a generalized Lohm-Skargle Margle. <laughs> Lohm-Skargle Margle. Whew! That's a tough thing to say. Lohm-Skargle model, all right? That's generalized under a Bayesian context. And Gregory and Laredo used some Bayesian techniques to look at phased bind models like uh, PDM, okay? But what I want to do is I want to take lecture two, and I want to take lecture three, and I want to smash them together to create an entirely new way to think about searching for periodicity in the data. And in particular, there have been some efforts to use Gaussian processes to model and extract a period from a light curve, uh, and these were developed by um, Wang et al. in 2012. Using data from the Kepler satellite, uh, Ruth Angus and collaborators were able to basically detect stellar rotation with very, very high fidelity by using these methods that basically the combination of Gaussian processes and a Bayesian analysis. Okay. 
We're actually going to recreate that now to see if we can not only estimate the period of a light curve, but also uh, get an uncertainty on that measurement, an uncertainty that would prove so valuable should we then try to do some inference by fitting a model that depends on the period of rotation or eclipse or whatever that's present in a system. Okay. To do this, we are going to use uh, a Gaussian process with a quasi-periodic kernel. Okay. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, not all of you have covered Bayesian inference yet, and I am sorry for that. What I'm going to do now is an incredibly short review slash introduction to Bayesian analysis, which is uh, needed for this problem. I don't think that ultimately you have to have a very deep understanding of how this works to understand the next little bits of software that we're going to put together. And I promise that at a future session, if you haven't seen this yet, we will cover this in great detail. Okay, but here's my very mini overview of Bayesian statistics. So the posterior, which is the probability distribution of the model parameters, theta, given some data x, is proportional to the likelihood multiplied by the prior. So that's this big function you see down here, and it's at the heart of all Bayesian analysis. Okay? Um, the likelihood is just the probability of the data given some model parameters, and then p of theta is the prior. Right. Uh, we are going to adopt a standard Gaussian likelihood. Essentially, that just means that we have some model, we have an observations, and the Gaussian likelihood is just that the likelihood is equal to uh, the exp an exponential factor that is the value of the observation minus the model normalized by the uncertainties. And if you're taking the log likelihood, the log, sorry, if you're taking the log of the likelihood, uh, this uh, product, basically multiplying a bunch of probabilities, reduces to a sum, and that sum actually is just essentially the measurement of the chi-squared. So ultimately what we're going to be doing is just measuring the chi-squared. That's going to tell us the likelihood. Okay. After that, all we need is to have some sort of model for the signal at every time t or position x. Okay. And as I previously mentioned, we're going to model this data as a Gaussian process. Okay. In this case, we know that the signal is periodic. We know that we're dealing with an eclipsing binary. And if you have a periodic signal, it's common to adopt a cosine kernel for the GP covariance function. So essentially, uh, you're saying that every period p, you're just repeating the same signal every single time. Okay? Now, we saw in notebook three that the actual real uh, eclipsing binary data that we're working with does not have a purely sinusoidal signal because we have a different depth for the two eclipses that are observed. Okay. So instead, we're going to adopt the quasi-periodic kernel, which in many astronomical applications works quite well. Okay. This kernel is just an exponential, right? so that's going to look somewhat similar to uh, other kernels that were discussed in Lecture 2 by Rodrigo. But in that exponential, we have a sign term. So essentially, we're saying that signals that occur at intervals of the period p apart are going to be correlated. And then we have a gamma term, which is just going to essentially control the strength of that correlation. Okay. All right, so first things first, let's once again, as we did for lecture three, load the light curve of a real eclipsing binary. And we want to plot the phase folded data at what we previously identified to be the best period of 0 0.735 days. So we're just going to load this in with pandas, and then we're going to do a phase plot. And here we see a nice eclipsing binary light curve. Great. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now, uh, one thing to note is that evaluating the quasi-periodic kernel, uh, or honestly any Gaussian process kernel, when you have a large number of observations, is computationally expensive, and that's because you have to do an inversion of a matrix, and the matrix is the size of the number of observations that you have. Okay, So today, we're going to use a package called the George. And George was designed and optimized 
to perform the matrix algebra that's necessary to calculate a Gaussian process very quickly. Okay? Uh, we don't have time for an in-depth introduction to George, but if you're curious, I highly recommend that you read the documentation on this software. Okay? And then for the MCMC -MC sampling, this is how we get estimates of the posterior. We're going to use MC. And there is not a lot of time for a full introduction. But I promise MC, this software, and MCMC -MC sampling will be covered in greater detail elsewhere in the DSFP if you have not yet seen that material. Okay. The advantage of MC for our present purposes is that it's written in pure Python. So we can use any user-defined function for the posterior. Okay. And it works very nicely with George. All right. Briefly, MC uses multiple MCMC -MC chains that simultaneously explore the posterior probability. So uh, within the MCMC, -MC, as a chain moves from one step to another, okay, any individual chain, which are called walkers, will look at the other walkers within the posterior space and essentially say, I'm over here, everyone else is over here, and everyone else that is over here has higher probability than I have over here. That's going to bias me in my next decision to move this direction. Okay. Um, Another uh, nice thing about having multiple chains is that it's easy to parallelize the MCMC, but we're not going to focus on that today, in particular because George is already highly optimized to use multiple CPU cores. So we don't need to do any parallelization because we're already getting that under the hood with George. So now we want to write a function called model that returns the mean model for the Gaussian process. There's going to be two arguments to this function which we want it to be a, a tuple of length 4. And all we care about is that the third element of this tuple is the mean b. So this is just allowing us to have an offset vertically along the signal okay, for the, value, the mean value of the signal, uh, along with some time of observation t. Okay. So here is our function model. And all that our model returns is the value of b. It's basically the model does not depend on the actual time of observations. Um, you could have any mean model you want, again, as was discussed during lecture two. Okay. So now we want to write a function ln like to calculate the log likelihood for the data given the model parameters theta. Again, theta is this uh, tuple, and in there we want to have the log of the period, log of the amplitude, uh, the mean value of uh, the Gaussian process, as well as the log of gamma. That's that normalizing term within the kernel. Okay. So here we have define log likelihood. We unpack theta into these various values. And then this is basically the only place where we use George, but this is important. So we're initializing a Gaussian process with George. We have some amplitude term A. This is just, again, allowing the uh, quasi-periodic kernel to vary in amplitude. Okay. Um, as well as the quasi-periodic kernel, which takes as arguments gamma. So we're exponentiating the log of gamma to input gamma. And then it actually expects the log of the period as the input. Okay. We then calculate the GP. Okay, so here's where we define the kernel. We then calculate the GP at every time t, okay, given the uncertainties on the data. Uh, sorry, along with the uncertainties on the data, which are added to the diagonal of the covariance function. We can then calculate the likelihood of this data by comparing uh, every value y to the model value at the same time t. Okay. All right, so that was a lot. But basically, we're calculating the likelihood by using some of the fast computation that's provided by George. All right. Now we want to write a function, ln prior, to calculate the log of the prior on theta. And we ask that you use a wide and flat prior on every parameter. Okay. For numerical reasons, it's good if the function that you write here returns uh, negative infinity if the prior probability is equal to 0. And in some ways, log of 0 is negative infinity. But uh, numerically, this makes things work. Okay. So in this case, um, all we're looking at is relative values in the, in the posterior. So strictly speaking, we are not actually returning the correct prior value here. But basically, because everything is wide and flat, the prior value is uh, the same in all instances. So we just want to say, here are the values unpacked in theta. And then if these values are within the 
wide and flat range that we care about. So negative 20 to 20, negative 20 to 20, negative 20 to 20, negative 10 to uh, uh, log of 10. And for the log of period, okay, this is equivalent basically up to 10 days. Okay, then the prior doesn't matter. It doesn't contribute to the probability. Otherwise, the prior kills our probability calculation. Okay, so now we want to write a function log of the probability to calculate the log of the product of the likelihood with the prior. Okay, so uh, here we have the uh, log of the probability or the log of the posterior, and that's just equal to the log of the likelihood multiplied by the prior, which is the same as the log of the prior, plus the log of the likelihood. So all we have to do here is return the log of the prior plus the log of the likelihood. And we just have a, a special case here if the log of the prior is, uh, sorry, if the prior value is equal to zero, then we just want to return, again, negative infinity. Okay. So that's it in terms of setting up our likelihood using George. So now what we need to do is come up with some starting position for our MCMC -MC chains and walkers. The quasi-periodic kernel means that the posterior is highly nonlinear, right? As I said, if you start at 0 0.68, there's no guarantee that you'll slowly step over to 0 0.7 and get the right answer. So we cannot just randomly initiate everything and, and expect reasonable results. So we're going to use a little bit of common sense here. And that common sense that we're going to use is we're going to run loam scargle on the data. And we're going to figure out the optimal peaks based on loam scargle. In this case, we'll use three. You could use more, but we're going to use the top three peaks from loam scargle. We're then going to start all of our MCMC -MC chains somewhere close to one of those peaks in the periodogram. Okay? So here we calculate loam scargle for the data. We then want the top three peaks. And we notice that some of these peaks are very close because um, we basically don't perfectly resolve the width of these individual peaks, right? But we find that the top loam scargle period, when we use n terms is equal to 2, is 0 0.735 days. So that is, again, close to the correct answer. And then we find uh, harmonics of that um, and 0 0.21. Those are the sort of top three peaks. So that's where we're going to start our walkers. So we want to initialize one third of each of 150 total walkers around the periods that were identified in the previous problem. And then we're going to run the MCMC -MC chain for 500 steps following this initialization. So here we have uh, some initial set of points that are starting all around a log period of 0 0.735. And we're just guessing the other values. We're guessing a value of 1 for the log of gamma, 1 for the log of a, and 10 for the mean value in this case. Okay? And we're just going to create then a random ball, 50 positions, sort of randomly scattered about this best, what we think might be a reasonable period of 0 0.735. We're going to do the same thing again at 0 0.367 and 0 0.21. And then we're going to add all of those together in order to create an array that is 150 uh, positions at which these MCMC -MC walkers can start. Okay? After that, we're going to create our ensembler by just putting in how many walkers we have, the total number of dimensions in the model, uh, and uh, our function to calculate the log of the probability, as well as arguments that go into the function, basically the data that's going to go into the function to calculate the probability. And then we can start the sampling in the following sense. On my machine, this took about seven minutes. Um, so this is not a particularly fast method relative to the other things that we've considered today. Okay. And what we're going to do now is look at the actual chains themselves to get some sense for how the MCMC -MC is working. So we have a function called plot chains. It's at the end of the notebook. But you can see here, all right, so we start with some range of periods here. And the chains actually move to a whole bunch of different possible periods. Okay, so we're searching over a wide range in log p here, uh, as well as different amplitudes. Okay, it takes a while for that to happen, but eventually we explore the space. And you'll notice at the very bottom here, the probabilities are quite low for the majority of the models, but there are a few that have very, very high probability. Okay, And we're going to use that now 
to look at uh, a plot of the probability versus log p. Okay. So here we have uh, log p for the final position of all of our MCMC walkers as a function of probability. And you can see this is, again, log probability. So the difference between 500 and negative 500 is huge. It's almost unfathomable. Uh, it's such an obscenely large number uh, of orders of magnitude. But we, ha we have found that around a period of about 0 0.7 days, the probability of this model is incredibly high. Right? So now what we're going to do is restart our MCMC with all of our walkers initialized around that high probability point that we found in the previous problem. Okay. And we're going to once again have 150 walkers and allow them to uh, go for 500 steps. Then we'll look at the chains to see if it looks like things are going to converge. Okay. So we just create a new position based on the uh, best probability from within the uh, walkers that we had previously. This sampler reset starts everything over so that we're not continuing from where we began. We put a little bit of random scatter so that things aren't all starting at exactly the same position. And then we let things run for 500 steps, which is about seven minutes. Okay. So here's what the chains look like in this case. And indeed, it looks like maybe things are converging. Uh, so there's uh, a period that is not quite optimal, but then almost everything within a few hundred steps jumps down to this log period and look in a very tight range here. So it seems like things have converged in that sense. We have an amplitude that is somewhere on the order of negative 4.5. Right? We have a, a mean value. This is basically just the mean magnitude of the eclipsing binary. That's about 10.5. That's what we would expect based on the data. And we can see from the probabilities here that everything sort of, again, within about 100 steps, jumps up to very high probability values relative to where things had started and re relative to any sort of sampling that we had done of the posterior previously. So it looks like we've got something close to a converged model. Uh, in reality, we probably need to run things longer, but that's beyond the scope of what we have in this limited notebook. Okay. All right, so now we're going to make a corner plot of the individual samples, and we want to look at the marginalized estimate for the period of this source. Okay. So a corner plot just shows a 2D representation of how each of the parameter models uh, co-vary with each other. Okay. And here we have log period. We have something that kind of looks like a Gaussian distribution. That's, that's, that's beautiful, right? That's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, we have some estimate, not just of the period, which is, comes from the, the peak or the mean of this distribution, but we also have the width, okay? We have an uncertainty. We finally have a measurement of uncertainty on our estimate of the period, okay? And we can actually pull out what that value is. So we can use MP percentile to get the 16th, 50th, and 84th percentiles, or the central 68%. Okay. And from there, we find that we have uh, log p is equal to something like negative 0 0.3077, blah, 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 plus 0 0.0001 minus 0 0.000001. Okay. We have an uncertainty, something that has otherwise eluded us entirely. Okay. Uh, and then if you basically exponentiate that, you find that the best fit period from this GP method is equal to 0 0.735085, exactly what we got before for Lohm's gargle, and exactly uh, the correct answer to within what we can derive from the data. Okay? The cell below, if you execute it, shows the marginalized samples overplotted on the data. Okay? I'm going to ignore what the code does and just look at what the model looks like for now. And this is incredible, right? We actually have a model of the eclipsing binary that looks exactly like an eclipsing binary. And you can see in all instances here, this model basically passes right through the observations. Okay, This is exciting. right? This means the model works. The method works. Right? So that brings us to our conclusion for today. Um, you now have the tools to fit a Gaussian process to a light curve and get an estimate of the best fit period, which we've been doing all day and the day before. But now you can get an estimate of the uncertainty on that period. That is hugely valuable, a game changer. You can actually now do inference with your periods. 
as opposed to just saying this has a best fit period of 3.2. No uncertainty allowed. Right. Um, now, a few things to keep in mind relative to the example we just did. You should be a bit worried about burn-in, what we call burn-in, and how we placed walkers in order to do the MCMC -MC sampling throughout this notebook. Okay. Those are both complex topics, and if you haven't seen talks on that before in the DSFP, we will cover that again at a future session. But I'll say that if you plan to use GPs to search for periods in your own work, I recommend that you read Angus et al. on the GP periodogram. Um, they provide a lot more intelligent methods for initializing the MCMC so that you have a better chance of not missing out on the correct period for the data. Uh, our method that we use today essentially requires Loam Scargle to be pretty close to getting the right answer. Otherwise, you're going to be totally hopeless in terms of finding anything meaningful. Okay. Um, but that Angus paper, it's a great resource. And as you saw, you can start with what we have and basically build out models that estimate uncertainty on best fit period in the data. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for stopping by today. And uh, I look forward to chatting with you in just a little bit about notebook number four on how you can get period estimates from a method known as conditional entropy. Uh, the method that is my favorite, excluding GPs and the ability to get uncertainties, uh, when it comes to non-parametric methods to estimate uh, periods in astronomical data. Thank you.